All right, welcome back to another episode of the Sci-Fi, not Blasters and Blades podcast. I don't know why I said that. I'm looking right at it. Every time I mess that up, Doc says I owe her a dollar, so she's going to get really rich off this. But uh, hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies, a place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place. We are the podcast that puts the fun in dysfunction. So without further ado, we're going to let you introduce yourself. Mr. Jack Campbell, can you tell our audience who you are? Um, My real name is John Henry. I write under the pen name Jack Campbell. And I write um, a lot of speculative fiction, different kinds. And I'm retired Navy. And uh, it's good fiction indeed. Uh, so you're one of the first, uh, one of the few authors we've interviewed where I actually read their books before we started the podcasting and I knew who they were already. So <laughs> you win the bonus points. Um, so the next part, speaking of, dear listener, of that introduction is how we first found them. So when I first uh, got out of the Army and I was doing the VA route, I was looking for other veterans who were also authors uh and i found his lost fleet series and then it was actually good so even more cool points and i've been of the lost fleet series the cool thing is i don't know if your writing has been pretty consistent but your narrator you could watch his career path grow because the time between you know with traditionally published books and if you start with book one and you work your way through the whole series in one setting like i did like you could constantly hear his skills improving as a narrator which is kind of cool so all right, sir, but because you've done this before, we mixed it up a little bit, but the religion question, you don't escape. So, Aliens, Predator, or The Terminator? Well, if you're only talking about the movie Aliens, then definitely Aliens. Um, that's, that's, that's the good one. Marines. Absolutely, I agree. And they gave us some pretty good one-liners, so you can't complain about that. Game over, man! <laughs> All right, and because we're polytheistic, and you haven't answered this one yet, Game of Thrones, Lord of the Ring, or Wheel of Time? I'm a little old-fashioned, I guess, Lord of the Rings. It's hard to compete with that. It's almost unfair to put it in there, but it's so iconic. You almost kind of have to. So we here at the Blasters and Blades love both the sci uh, the fantastical and the scientific, but what was your first love? Was it science fiction or fantasy? Um. Uh, I guess kind of a mix of them. Uh, the first uh, genre book that I remember reading was uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Mastermind of Mars, which, you know, it's kind of fantasy and it's kind of science fiction. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that's what got me started on it. Solid answer. You can't go wrong with John Carter. So what was your first memory of engaging in speculative fiction? Obviously, we asked the last question, just sci-fi or fantasy, because mm -hmm. that's the prominent ones. But there's other subgenres within spec fic. So what was your first memory of the wide umbrella that is speculative fiction? Um, the, the strongest early memory was um, when my family was stationed on Midway Island in the late 1960s. And, um, you know, we only had uh, one local TV station to broadcast for a few hours a day. The base theater on weekends would show um, matinees in the afternoon that consisted of two one-hour programs from the States. You know, one of them would always be something like Mission Impossible or Big Valley or something. And the other would always be an episode of Star Trek, the original series. So I got to see Star Trek, the original series on the big screen. Oh, that's cool. And, um, that, uh, that is probably one of my strongest memories of, of being introduced to uh, science fiction and uh, seeing uh, how important the characters and the stories were in, in, uh, in all the episodes. Do you think science fiction influenced your decision to go and be a naval officer? Um, no, I don't, I don't think not as strongly as just... Um, life experiences otherwise. I mean, my father was in the Navy. Um, <clears throat> that that was probably the biggest single factor. So what is it about speculative fiction as an umbrella that you love so much? I love the way you can look at a situation in a different way. You know, you can take something that people already know, some story that people have already heard a hundred times, but you can put it in a totally different circumstance, a different setting, different people and 
find new aspects to that story so that people can see different things in it than they ever have before. Science fiction lets you divorce things from those familiar settings, uh, maybe contemporary issues, and instead take a fresh look at everything. And that's, I think, the strongest point. Good answer. So how did your love of speculative fiction as you know a genre, watching it on the big screen, the television, reading the books, how did that transition into you deciding to sit down and write your own story? Um, I don't know. I guess like a lot of writers, I just I just had that urge to write. Um, and, you know, my naval career, I guess, helped me transition to that because obviously it taught me how to write well and and how to edit and how to um, write things that uh, aren't strictly reality based, which is what we do with a lot of stuff in the military. Um, but it just reached the point where when uh, I was coming up for retirement. It seemed like a good time to try to bring those stories to action that I'd met enough people and done enough things that I could maybe tell some stories. And good ones they are. So many authors will let their own real life experiences influence the stories they tell, but were there any specific formidable moments you think that shaped you as a storyteller? Um, probably, um, one was we had uh, on my first ship, Spruance. Uh, she was the first ship of her class, a lot of new things on her. And we had this inspection called an in-surf, which is notoriously very difficult. Um, we thought we were in pretty good shape, but they came aboard and they were, uh, they just tore us apart for things that we were totally unable to deal with. For example, our, our damage control assistant got a major down check because the uh, main deck was two inches too close to the first deck. Um, wasn't tall enough. And he's like, what am I supposed to do about this? Said, well, it's got to be fixed. Um, so we had four days of that kind of thing, getting torn to pieces. Last night, we were all told, you have to stay on the ship all night. No particular reason, just because. Those were in the days when we were still getting movies um, sent to us uh, on reels. So we looked at what the ship had, and we had this new movie called Meatballs. So we decided to watch Meatballs because it's a comedy. And there's one scene in there where the, the summer camp with Bill Murray's character in it is getting uh, wiped out by the rich kids' summer camp in their annual competition. And Bill Murray gives this speech to them about how it really doesn't matter how hard they work or how difficult everything is or any victories they manage to achieve because really it just doesn't matter. And by the end of this speech, he's got everybody in the camp shouting, it just doesn't matter. And they go on to win. So the next morning, we're sitting in the wardroom around the junior officer's table waiting for the executive officer and the senior officers to arrive, knowing we're going to get chewed out terribly. And somebody suddenly says, it just doesn't matter. And we all started pounding the table and chanting, it just doesn't matter. <laughs> and that, of course, was the point at which the executive officer and the senior officers arrived and all gave us dirty looks. But... Uh, that was okay because we'd broken the code. It just doesn't matter. And that was a moment that helped me realize the way a story can help people through things. That they can apply something from a story in ways probably not anticipated that can help all of us through parts of our lives uh, when we need a little humor or a little good example or, or anything else. And so I remember that. That's a good one. So speaking of the military science fiction, obviously we mentioned that you retired from the U U.S. Navy. So we ask all of our authors who are also military veterans this question, but how do you feel like your time as a sailor affects the way you tell stories? Oh, it has a huge effect. Um, all the, uh, the other sailors I knew, the time at sea, the experience with the ocean itself, um, the immense forces involved, um, the, the different places I went and the things I did, uh, many of which I probably would not have chosen to do voluntarily. Um, but, but all those things had a huge impact in my writing. So do you ever draw on people that you knew while you were in the military? Oh, all the time. Uh, usually it's just, you know, an aspect here or an aspect there. Sometimes I will pick a full person, uh, a full uh, character and, and use that individual. But usually it's, it's just aspects of them. But, but uh, that's uh, a huge amount of, of where I get my characters from is, is the people I know and uh, got to serve with. 
So was uh, was Blackjack based on the main character of the Lost Fleet series? Was he based on anyone you actually knew or just sort of composite? Um, he's a composite, um, both of historical figures and of some of my, my best commanding officers. Uh, my first, uh, one of my CEOs on the Spruance, uh, Captain Richard Hayes, a uh, very good officer who gave me uh, some examples. Um, a CEO I worked for, um, uh, Admiral Cathal Flynn, um, those good leaders gave me a lot of inputs for him, but, uh, he's also got some, uh, historical, uh, figures who went into him as well. So he's definitely a composite, but one heavily influenced by the best officers I served with. So do you think your time specifically commanding ships at sea? Cause not everyone that was military has experience as closely applicable to what they're writing as you do. Do you think that time commanding a ship at sea helps you write better and more realistic space combat? Um, absolutely. I think it has a huge impact, um, uh, both for understanding the, the environment of, you know, the engagement, but also simply in terms of the relative motion. If you're a ship driver, you learn to be able to figure out if I'm going this way and they're going that way, um, where are we going to end up relative to each other? Um, avoiding colliding with people, but also working out um, different paths. And I could do it in three dimensions by you know, using aviator hands to, to match it. But um, I think that had a huge impact in my being able to do realistic space battles is being able to mentally feel how the motions of uh, these different uh, ships moving through such vast areas would relate to each other. Um, so I think that had a huge impact. So we've talked about how your time in the military affects the way you tell stories, but let's talk about things from the other side of the engagement. So do you think your time in uniform affects the way you engage with content as a reader or a watcher of movies? Oh, definitely. Uh, the, the same thing we all have, you know, when you're uh, seeing something and, and it just doesn't make sense. Um, the, the officer enlisted relations are, are totally wrong. The, uh, you know, the, the whole Star Trek universe idea that the most uh, technically capable people on the ships are the most senior officers. Um, that's uh, it's it's kind of hard to suspend belief when you're running into things like that. Um, so, yeah, everything you have, you're judging it against your um, experience with um, what you've uh, encountered. Okay. So transitioning uh, away from the writing side, let's talk about things from a fan angle. Have you gotten any cool fan art or had anybody cosplay your characters yet? No, uh, I haven't seen anyone cosplay yet, but I have gotten an occasional uh, piece of, of fan art, which is nice. Uh, most of those are from my uh, science fantasy series, but uh, you know, it's, it's really cool when you get it. Absolutely. Has anyone asked for your autograph yet? <laughs> yeah. Um, not at first, of course, but uh, nowadays it's... Um, it's it's pretty cool. Um, the, uh, the the funny thing is when someone comes up and asks me how much I charge for an autograph, and I always I'm always like, hey, we're good. You're at, you want my autograph? That's enough. That's uh, yeah. Day and me. So do you remember the first time someone asked you for your autograph, where it wasn't like friends and family? <sighs> yeah, um, I forget which convention it was, but it was actually a, a magazine story, the story in analog uh, that they they wanted me to sign. Um, so yeah, that does stand out because it's, it's, it's a cool moment. Yeah. So finally, uh, were there any weird or funny interactions with fans that you had since you started writing? Most authors have a lots of those. The question is how family friendly are they? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the weirdest one I ever had was, um, I did a, um, novella called Swords and Saddles, which is about a mounted unit of U.S. cavalry from the 1870s that gets, um, hurled into an alternate North America. And um, so they disappear without a trace from, from our history. And I got a, a, a angry email from a, a reader saying, this did not happen. This, no unit disappeared at this time. Why are you writing things that aren't true? Um, <laughs> you know, what do you say? So <clears throat> was your bad, you know, I, when you were in college, did did you major in a science degree, or were you a history major? Is that why you you chose the midi uh, the historic angle? 
Well, strictly speaking, I, I don't, I guess I didn't go to college. I went to the Naval Academy, sort of a trade school. Um, and my major there was um, international relations, but being the Naval Academy, like all the service academies, you have to graduate with a Bachelor of Science. So I have an unspecified Bachelor of Science with a major in international relations. Okay. Um, I know that it is possible to major in history at the academies, but I wasn't sure if you mm -hmm. did or you just were a lover of all things. Um, all right. So this is the part of the introduction uh, where you get to tell us everything you have written. So can you give us sort of the Reader's Digest version of your body of works? Um, well, my first series was the Starks War trilogy, which was written right after I left the Pentagon. And it's a very, a very angry trilogy about um, uh, the military being micromanaged and uh, a heavily politicized officer corps having a negative impact on the uh, military. Um, then I wrote a four book series called Jag in Space, which is a military legal science fiction thriller thing. Um, probably the one that's most based on things I actually experienced. And um, unfortunately that didn't sell too well initially, but people keep discovering it. Then I came in with the uh, Lost Fleet series, which was initially just gonna be a six book series. And then <clears throat> demand for it and uh, grew. So now it's, there's the six book original series, the five book follow on um, Beyond the Frontier, the uh, parallel series called The Lost Stars, and the prequel series called the Genesis Fleet, and then right now this latest trilogy, the um, Outlands. So there's a lot of books in that series. Um, and I also have science fantasy series. Uh, the primary one there is the uh, Dragons of Door Castle. It's called uh, Steampunk with Dragons, and uh, that was followed with a sequel series as well, Daughter of Dragons, and recently a prequel series, Pirate of the Prophecy. Um, then let's see, I have a standalone uh, young adult novel called The Sister Paradox uh, about a uh, teenage boy who's uh, an only kid in his family and is very happy with that. But one day his sister shows up at his school with a sword and tells him they have something they have to do. And aside from that, um, oh, there's also a standalone novella that was published called um, The Last Full Measure, which is alternate American Civil War, and quite a few other pieces of short fiction um, dealing with their alternate history, time travel, uh, humor, anything which struck me at the time. Okay, I've just added more to my list of books by you that I didn't know I didn't read yet. So, um, while we're going to take a moment before we dive into the book that got you here, we're going to pause for a moment while we shamelessly show for the man. Once, long ago, Jackson Rook was a war hero. Raised from boyhood to pilot a mech, he fought gallantly for the rebellion against the collectivists. Now he's a criminal, a smuggler with a new mission. Steal a top-of-the-line mech and deliver it to a world so hostile, even the air will kill you. In the smuggling business, it's best to take the money and ask no questions. But when the client runs roughshod over the planet's citizens, Rook must look deep inside and see if the heart of a warrior still beats within. Gunrunner, by best-selling authors Larry Correa and John Brown. From Bane Books at BaneBooks.com. Um, that is an amazing cover, even so. So obviously, um, those uh, the you gave us your body of work, but here we're here today to talk about your book Resolute, which is part of the Lost Fleet Outland series. So where did you get the premise, um, both for the main universe and then for this set of stories within it? Well, the main universe um, derived from uh, two ideas. One was the very common myth in human cultures of a sleeping hero, you know, some great person from the past who isn't dead, but is just sleeping. And someday when they're really needed, they'll come back. And uh, there's general agreement. Those are based on real people. And just wondering what would happen if they really did awaken in the future. And everybody said, yay, you're our superhero. Come save us. Uh, how would that feel to that person? Uh, the other thing was somebody who worked in the Star Trek universe asking, whether they could do a long retreat in space. And uh, all of us who were asked said, no, you probably couldn't make that work in Star Trek because you know, you'd be caught or get away. But it did have leave me wondering whether you could do a classic long retreat scenario in space and make it believable. And then at some point uh, I realized I could put those two things together and uh, give me a, a full story from that. And then the, the 
probably the other major influence on the uh, general storyline was that I was putting this together after 9-11 and there were a lot of people rather casually talking about being a very long war up ahead uh, and wanting to address the, the questions of what happens to a military that has to fight a very long war and a civilian society that's supporting a very long war um, to, to uh, address what would happen over the course of, of such a conflict. So those were the, the primary setups. And then in Outlands, this is taking place um, well along in the stories. And uh, our hero, uh, Admiral Geary, has uh, overcome every obstacle. And the government has once again sent him far away so that uh, people who don't like uh, the government won't use him as a, something to rally around. Um, and he's trying to deal with these newly discovered alien species and more are appearing on the scene at every moment now uh, he's trying to deal with them and deal with different humans who are trying to exploit uh, the situation for their own purposes um, as well as um, people who are still trying to um, exploit the divisions from the war to pursue their own ends that is deep, but I like it. I like the way you did the aliens before uh, in that series. I don't want to spoil it, so you should go listen to it, people. But it, it it was good. All right, so before we dive any deeper to talk about the main characters and such, we're going to take a moment where we look at this glorious cover. So what is the story behind this cover, and how much say did you have in it? I know I've seen your covers change a few times over the years. Well, um, this particular cover, I was uh, given uh, you know approval for it. Um, but this uh, particular design, seeing him from the back with something in front of him, was something they, they the publisher chose uh, for this. The Lost Fleet covers have a, uh, a somewhat interesting history. The initial series always showed the um, main character, Admiral Geary, on the cover with a big gun because marketing uh, at the publisher thought that was necessary. Of course, in the books, Geary never walks around with a big gun. So I kept getting all these questions. Why are they showing him on the cover with this? So finally, in uh, one of the Beyond the Frontier books, I had Geary and one of the other main characters joke about the covers, the fact that they always showed him carrying a big gun. And when I did that, they finally changed them. Um, so... It's, it's basically up to the publisher, but they've got this one motif for the Outland series. Uh, the first book also showed him like that. And then there's this one, and I understand the third one as well. And I inadvertently wrote a scene in Implacable, uh, which is the next and, and third book in the trilogy, which uh, perfectly suits this cover. So um, hopefully they will use that. Okay. Um, so it sounds like you just get some approval process, but they do most of the, the work on the back end based on like marketing needs. So you don't have as much say. Well, I think now they're paying more attention to scenes from the books um, right. and trying to illustrate them. Uh, this, this in particular reflects a scene from the book, a, a burial in space. Uh, the, the, the society they belong to uh, when they do burials in space, they like to cast them into the sun, into the nearest star. Um, so that's that's their grave marker, the biggest uh, eternal flame you could ask for. Um, so these these uh, latest ones and the, the ones for the um, Genesis fleet all reflected scenes in the books, which is always gratifying. Okay, that's as good as answer as any. So let's talk about the book itself. So where does the you know for people that haven't read the Lost Fleet series first, can they read this series as a standalone, the Outland series? They could, yes. I, I try to write every one of my books with enough explanation in it, backstory, so that anyone picking it up can follow along. Obviously, there'll be a lot of spoilers in there, heck of a lot of spoilers, but um, anybody can pick it up. Anybody can read there and understand who's involved and what they're doing and everything else. They, they won't understand all the background that's gone on, but they'll have enough so that they know what's happening. Okay. Um, so what would your 30-second elevator pitch for Resolute be? Um, that he's dealing with this diplomatic mission to the aliens, 
Uh, he still he has to figure out what the aliens want, and the aliens are apparently still trying to figure out what we want. There are human actors trying to horn in on this, uh, trying to push their own thing, and they're all the smartest guy in the room, you know. Uh, and then in the midst of that, he's finally called on to address the most serious issue he's dealt with ever since um, he's assumed command of the fleet, which is that he's such a mythic figure that he can pretty much get away with anything he wants to do. And he's finally in a situation where he's going to have to use that power. And he's very uh, concerned about that, but he feels that it's either that or the alliance he's fought for will be destroyed. But at the same time, his actions might destroy the alliance. So, tough situation. Okay, and so what is it you think that makes the Lost Fleet Outland series special? Um, I think because I'm trying to address um, real aliens, you know, aliens who are actually aliens instead of humans with different um ears <laughs> or, or foreheads um and uh trying to balance all that trying to figure out what everyone wants and how humanity as a whole would be reacting to that uh in different ways uh and you know who's being the um who's trying to look out for the the interest of humanity as a whole rather than for their individual uh whatever they think will profit them in the short term now, when you say you're aliens that are are truly alien, do you mean just the culture, or did you make them um, physically distinct as well? Yeah, I try to make them physically distinct. You know, they're not all bipedal, humanoid-looking. Uh, they're, they're obviously uh, evolved from a variety of different uh, life forms, but also, as well, the way they think. The question of, you know, what do you mean? Uh, what do you, What do you want? I mean even among other humans, we have trouble figuring that out sometimes, you know, what do you mean by that word? And when you're dealing with an alien who doesn't even have the same uh, grounding in any sense with you, figuring out what they want and what they mean uh, is a, a real challenge. And for the writer, me, it's a big challenge to try to make them all distinct and different from humans in ways that seem plausible. Okay. I like that answer. So which tropes do you feel like Resolute hits the best? Um, hmm. I guess the tropes of alien contact, as well as the tropes of military civil relations and the responsibilities of command. Okay. So other than the obvious space fleet genre, uh, what subgenre or genres do you feel like this story Resolute fits into? Um, well, definitely uh, space opera, um, hard science fiction, because I do try to, to stick to science. It makes me write better if I have to uh, uh, pay attention to physics. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, those would be the two primaries, space opera, military science fiction, hard science fiction. Okay. Um, yours was one of the few that called itself mill S or excuse me, a hard science fiction that I actually enjoyed. You, uh, you wrote it so everybody could understand it while still trying to stick to the physics. So I did like that. Um, so now let's talk about the story itself. What can you tell us about your main character? Obviously, you know, John Geary is, is the main character, the, the lost Admiral who comes back, but are the, is he the only main character? Yeah, he's the only main character. There's some very important secondary characters, uh, people who have been with him for the whole fight. It's sort of like uh, Nelson and his band of brothers thing, although since you know this is uh, modern up to date, it's, it's it's band of brothers and sisters, uh, commanders who have stuck with him through everything. And they play a very important role in, because he's aware of his own limitations. And so he is willing to listen to someone tell him, you need to think about this, or this might be a mistake. Uh, he makes the final decisions himself, but this uh, this group of commanding officers who he trusts you know, play a major role in the in the story. Okay, um, so you mentioned some of the secondary characters. Is there any that was your favorite? Oh, there's quite a few. I mean, I do like uh, Master Chief Giannini. He's he's a tribute to. Um, Petty Officer uh, Fatso Giannini that uh, 
was written about in the 1950s and 1960s. And he's a, he's a, he's a conniver. He can get things done. If you need something found and it's nowhere in the fleet, he will find it somehow. Uh, just don't ask questions. Um, he's, he's fun to write about. And then um, probably the, the other, uh, the closest thing to another main character would be Captain Tanya Dejani, who's, uh, um, she's been described as a blood knight. Uh, she she lives for being able to command a battle cruiser and fight and everything. But uh, she's also um, a very strong supporter of Gary and um, the person who will be most likely to tell him, you're making a mistake, think twice. So she plays a very important role. Okay. So when you mentioned the the master chief who could make things happen uh, behind the scenes, did you have anybody like that in your command? Unofficially, of course. Oh, unofficially, of course. Yeah. You know, there were, I mean, you always know there's uh, the person. Uh, we had one supply officer who was very good that way. You could just, Suppo, we need this. And they say it's not available anywhere. Was, well, just give me a couple of days and it would show up. Um, I think the military <laughs> requires individuals like that in every unit to keep everything running. Because if you try to do everything by the book, well, it never shows up. Yeah, there's that old expression that um, there's only there are no thieves in the military. There's just everyone trying to get their stuff back. <laughs> yes. So does your story have any specific bad guys that they have to confront? Or is it more of a sort of man versus environment situation for this novel? There, there are specific bad guys they confront. Um, it's not uh, this one bad guy they've been dealing with all along, but rather uh, individuals who, I think I said before, they each of these people think they're the smartest person in the room and they're out for themselves and not really thinking past that. And that's the sort of thing they're dealing with. There's also some couple of the alien species they've encountered who are doing their best to try to screw everything up and uh, trigger conflict. And uh, he has to deal with that without uh, letting their tricks achieve what they want. So a variety of bad guys in this one. So speaking of characters, uh, you put Jack, uh, Blackjack in a lot of horrible situations. Um, so if he ever met you in a back alley, how do you see that interaction playing out? <laughs> well, he's a decent guy. So um, uh, hopefully he wouldn't uh, strangle me. But uh, he would probably say, man, did you have to? Um, on the other hand, I've done some nice things to him. Uh, he's had some really good things happen to him. So hopefully I would be able to say, hey, yeah, but what about? And uh, <laughs> make him happy. But, yes, I've, I've done a lot of really rough things to him. Um, but the strange things about writers, we create these characters we really care about, and then we do terrible things to them. Um, don't know what that says about us. But uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully he and I would end up having a bunch of drinks in the bar and uh, swapping stories about uh, – might have bends and what ifs. All right. Um, so since we talk about characters, when you write, do you have a favorite character archetype? I think my favorite uh, sort of character is um, basically a regular person who finds themselves in an extraordinary situation and has to make the choice. Do they step up and do their very best? Or do they uh, do they run away? Um, do they give up? Um, and I, I like to put what seems like ordinary people in such situations where they have to draw on reserves and capabilities they may not have thought they had in order to not let down anyone who's depending on them. Um, I guess that's my archetype. Okay, so basically the everyman. Okay. Yeah. So finally, what can you tell us about the universe? In many series, the, the worlds where the story takes place are as much a character as the protagonist or antagonist. So can you give the readers what they can expect from the worlds of the Lost Fleet? Well, there's a wide variety of worlds um, with uh, a wide variety of, of different uh, environments on them. The um, basic setup is that, that humanity has exploded along uh, this arm of the galaxy and uh, the two main protagonists were the Alliance, to which Gary belongs, 
hundreds of stars belong to that. And then the bad guys, the syndicate worlds, um, also was very strong before, um, spoiler, um, they lost the war and started falling apart. Um, and it was, it was sort of a setup actually presaging what's happened in Ukraine where the, the bad guys, the syndicate worlds thought they could score a big quick victory over the Alliance, but the Alliance fought back and well, they were in a stalemate, um, for a long time. Um, and then there are other worlds um, that don't belong to either the Alliance or the Syndicate worlds back toward all the way back to old Earth itself. And increasingly, they're discovering that humanity is bumping up against different kinds of alien species. And they're, they're figuring out why certain probes into certain directions never came back. Um, and so uh, you've got a tremendous variety of human cultures and um, and uh, political systems uh, encountering a variety of aliens at this point. So normally, either Earth is the main planet of the of the universe, or there's the lost Earth situation where it's sort of faded into myth and, and legend, and no one really knows about that, and Earth is out of the picture. You chose to leave Earth in your universe. Everyone knew where it was. It just wasn't important anymore. So what made you decide to go that direction? Well, it just seemed uh, to feel appropriate to the, the setting that uh, these were people who they value their ancestors a great deal. And of course, the, the source of all their ancestors' ancestries is old Earth itself. So they venerate uh, the planet. But Earth itself is tired. You know, the people on it are tired. Um, they fought all their wars and they sent all their people out. And uh, so they're kind of a backwater, but they're a very important backwater. Um, and they still hanging on to a lot of um, their older systems and everything. Um, it just felt like a, a way to acknowledge that, you know, you can't really lose a planet. Um, but um, how would people regard the home of humanity from uh, a distance of hundreds of light years? And uh, I just wanted to look at that kind of, of, of story. So right now you don't have, you have some stories, some plot elements that take place on Old Earth. Do you plan on revisiting that as a set piece or are you comfortable leaving it sort of in the background for now? Um, it's possible. Let's put it that way. There are, there are a number of directions that could be gone and, and certainly going back toward Old Earth and then, the, the mostly unknown human settlements that went the other direction uh, out along that direction of the galactic arm um, is, is certainly a possible storyline. So were you surprised? At, I mean, you've written other novels before the, the Lost Fleet universe took off. Were you surprised at how well it was received? Yes, it was a very pleasant surprise. Uh, I will not forget the moment when the, the publisher called and said, hey, we're doing a second printing. Of Dauntless. And I was like, oh, I got a second printing. Um, and then the sales um, just kept improving. And the really cool thing was it wasn't due to a lot of advertising or anything. It was word of mouth. Uh, people were reading the book and liking it and telling their friends. And so the books kept selling. So that was a wonderful um, surprise. And um, I'm still shocked. <laughs> that uh, people uh, enjoy it so much, but I'm trying to um, do my best to keep the quality of it up. So for those of us who aren't as familiar with raw numbers, how much, how many books are in a printing? I don't know how, what, like obviously it was a big deal because they called to tell you, but. Um, well, that can vary hugely. And, and they actually, they don't, they rarely tell you that. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, it can vary. If, if it's a brand new book nowadays, it could only be a few hundred or it could be several thousand or something like that. Um, it, it's still generally true that you can look at the, the number of printings to a book to tell how successful it is because um, paperbacks still sell, hardbacks still sell. But um, the exact numbers of each book that they um, put into a printing is based on whatever computations the publisher is making at that time. Yeah, I actually heard about your series through word of mouth. So when I first got my head injury, I couldn't actually read the 
print books would give me migraines. So I was I had to get a Kindle before I could read again because you could magnify the heck out of the print with those. Because even Ooh. with a head injury, even the large print sometimes can can be too much. And it was my uh, my physical therapist at the VA that actually recommended your series to me. So I found you what 2008. So you were on your third book, I think, back then, third or fourth. Yeah. Pretty close to the beginning of the Lost Fleet series, and then of course I spread outwards to your other stuff. But uh, but yeah, I, I enjoyed the way you did that. So part of this is just fan service on my end. <laughs> but I have you here, so I get to ask. All right. So clearly, uh, Resolute is part of a series, uh, and there are currently two books out. How many more? Like, where do you see this story arc going? Do you do you know or? Well, there's one. There's one more book which is was already written and been accepted by the publisher, and that's Implacable. Um, and that's um, uh, that at this point is the third book in the series, and that's where it should end at this point. Um, I mean, not in the sense of there's nothing else going on. There are more things to pursue. But at this point, Implacable is the, the last book in the in uh, the Outland series. So do you know what you're going to write after that? I'm thinking about it. Uh, I know people want more books in the universe, um, but when you've done, well, there's 14 books in the direct line from Dauntless to, to Implacable. And when you've done that many books in a universe, uh, you know the universe really well, you know the characters really well, but coming up with a story which is not a retread, coming up with new ideas, new challenges, um, that becomes harder and harder. So, um, I'm going to have to think about uh, possible new storylines. Okay. So uh, we'll have to get you back when you get new books out, though, because because I like your stuff. So, all right. So we know every literary universe has their own internally consistent rules of science and technology. So what sort of tech, other than obviously FTL and some sort of life support system, can we expect from this, this universe? Oh, well, the FTL is the most important thing. Um, let's see. Um, I tend to do my technology in terms of just uh, describing people using it, you know, the, the, the real thing. Um, and uh, the FTL is the most important part and keeping, <clears throat> keeping technology that uh, has limitations to it, like uh, fuel cells, they have to keep refueling uh, instead of running forever on, on one uh, beryllium sphere or whatever. Um, Let's see, any specific, I suppose the, the, the conferencing software would be fun. It's kind of super Zoom where you actually have people sitting at the table with you even though they're not there. Or you know, if you're doing message traffic, uh, instead of <clears throat> having to just look at their picture on there, you can actually have them sitting across from you, uh, seeming to. Uh, so it's more like a personal visit. I guess that's one of the, the more fun pieces of technology in there, although it does make meetings easier, so it's a definitely a double-edged sword. <laughs> so, with, with regard to the fuel cells, how do you how would you compare that to as far as the life of a cell for the fuel cell to like the ability of like say a nuclear carrier to stay away? Because um, well, it depends on um, demand, of course, but it's it's not like a, a, a nuclear reactor where you can. Um, um, Recore the thing and then run for 10 years. Uh, the fuel cells um, burn out pretty fast because of the intense power demands. So there's a constant need for them, and they're they're closer to almost um, burning um, conventional fuel in terms of the need to resupply because the power demands are so huge in these ships. Um, something like a reactor would just be drained out very quickly. Um, and I did that on purpose because I wanted to make clear the importance of those logistics issues and the decisions that the Admiral's making, uh, everybody's making, that they have to worry about, what if they run out of fuel? How? What's my fuel status? Where do I have to go to get more? All those kinds of things which drive real world military decisions and when you have to, when you put those in the story as well, it makes it more real. Okay. Um, so of all the tech that you invented in your universe, what would you want for your daily use? Ooh. 
Well, daily use, I don't know if you call it daily use, but I'd sure like to have the the, the jump drives be able to go to another star. Yeah. <laughs> How <laughs> I mean, could you not as a former ship's commander? That that would be so cool, you know? Uh, be able to actually see what's what's around other stars and, and explore those new horizons. That's that's what I would want. Okay. And obviously we mentioned previously that your universe had aliens in it. So when you go about creating your your alien creatures, and you've created fantasy creatures as well, do you let nature inspire you? You know, you flavor them with your nightmares, or do you make stuff up out of whole cloth? Like, how do you come to create these aliens and or fantastical creatures when you're writing more broadly? You don't have to stick just to the the Lost Fleet stuff, but just in general terms. Yeah, I I, I both think in terms of of mythologies. You know, like um, the dragons in my series are more like really large raptors, you know, the uh, velociraptors, uh, heavily armored, they can't fly. Um, mythology, uh, actual living creatures, including ones that are, that are extinct. There's, in certain periods on, on Earth, uh, the pre-Cambrian period, there's just some really weird stuff that lived on this planet that you can use as inspiration and imagining, you know, life forms that came from that. As well as, as imagining how people would react to certain things. For example, there's there's one species in the Lost Fleet we encountered, um, which are called the, the bear cows, because they look sort of like cute teddy bears, except that they're also bloodthirsty. And um, even though they're cute, they're also incredibly dangerous. But, of course, humans are going, oh, well, they're cute, so they must be nice. Um it's, it's fun to play with that idea and then think in terms of, okay, if this is this species is based on this, how would they perceive the universe? So, for example, the bear cows, they are uh, herbivores, herd animals, and they see any omnivore or carnivore like humans as implacable enemies. Not only are you competition for the herd, but you're out to eat them. So... It's you put all those things together and try to come up with these different perspectives uh, based on what they are and how they might see things. Not going to lie. When I first read that scene, I kept thinking, you know, one of those rednecks is going to be like, let's see if they make a good steak. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that scene to be in there, but, but you know, they were all moral and stuff about it. So yeah, yeah. I've been told my Marines are too well behaved. So well, at least on the page, but you focus mostly on the point of view of the, the naval commander. So it sort of fits that they would be uh, mind their manners when you're looking. Now, if you had a Marine POV for the story, it might be a little different. <laughs> that there is there is a, a Marine thing in Resolute, which, which a lot of people have uh, um, keyed on, uh, something that some drunken Marines do, oh, which uh, I think a lot of people consider very realistic. Well, I can't wait to read it. So uh, clearly uh, this interview is winding down, but was there anything about Resolute that we didn't ask that you wanted to tell us before we move on? Um, just that I think it, it still it um, carries the story along very well, and I think everyone who uh, reads it will enjoy it. And uh, there is a uh, an unexpected character in there, one that uh, does not appear in any of my other stories that uh, a lot of people enjoy. Okay. And if you didn't remember the previous episode, he was a Dragon Award uh, finalist for the military best military uh, novel for the sci-fi or fantasy category. I can't remember exactly how Dragon awards it, but it was well received. Um, so before we let you go, we do have to ask this question. So there are a lot of families that listen to this show together as they discover new sci-fi uh, for them to consume because there's a couple of family book clubs in our audience. So what rating would you give this as far as like suitability for kids? Like, you know, age range, if you will. Um, I guess if we were using movie ratings, it'd be PG. Um, I try to make my work accessible to uh, a wide range of ages. <clears throat> um, the language, for example, I do my best to catch the way military people speak, but um, I do it without using all the obscenities, <laughs> which... Uh, um, I, as as long as you catch the the rhythms of the speech and the, the things they say and the way they say them, you don't have to constantly have um, 
the repetition of certain words, which are the equivalent of like <laughs> in, in military speak. Uh, they just appear constantly, but they don't really mean much, you know, so you can leave them out as long as you've got the rest of it right. So, um, yeah, um, I one of the more gratifying things I hear is when I hear from people who say my my son read this, my daughter read this and recommended it to me. And it's like, oh, cool. OK, so how hard was that to dial back the language? I don't know. It's different in officer country than it was for us. Uh, in this <laughs> once. I can't imagine not an F-bomb every other word when I'm talking about combat forces doing their thing. Yeah, it's just. Um, like I said, focusing on the way the different people are saying it. Um, and somehow it comes out um, feeling uh, authentic. Um, I had, I've had um, veterans tell me that they were on their second or third reading of the book before they realized I wasn't using those words because- <laughs> It took me a second too. So what you didn't go the, the sort of tropish route that started after the the reboot of BSG, Battlestar Galactica, where they did like fracking and other words to substitute for the curse words when everyone knew kind of what they were saying. You didn't go that route, really. What made you decide on that? Was it for the same rationale? You well, wanted? because it's, it's so obvious, you know, that, that you're doing that. Um, it, it feels, you know, it's, it's being manufactured. Um, and I wanted people to feel that this was authentic dialogue. Um, without you know because those words you use in every other every other word sometimes they don't really mean anything you're just throwing them in there um yeah. and I, I guess because i'm fluent in that speech just as any veteran is um i was able to figure out ways to say the same things in in ways that felt right but didn't bother just left those out okay um so before we let you go dear listener please remember uh, to please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. So as I said before, writing and reading is sort of a sim uh, symbiotic relationship, and your reviews do help push them along in the algorithms on the various platforms, and they help um, publishers decide, you know, whether the right – or. To to purchase sequels in the universe. So, you know, you're doing your part to get more of the books you like when you leave reviews. Um, and, you know, you're you're writing them to other readers as well. So keep that in mind when you do. We do plan on, in the near future, dear listener, doing an episode diving into the, the value of reviews because we're going to have some former professional reviewers come on to talk with us. Um, but with that said, uh, Jack, can you tell listeners how they can find you on the internet? And as usual, the context will be in the uh, show notes. My uh, webpage is uh, Jack campbell.com and i also have uh, on facebook there's a group called fans of the lost fleet uh, which addresses everything i've written and uh, on facebook itself i'm available as as, as john henry so um any of those ways are the the easiest ways to get a hold of me all right and that will be in the show notes dear listener you can find us on Twitter at twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show. You can find us on our email at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook where all the shenanigans happen over at facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. Again, backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. You can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades. Again, anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades, where you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month. You can help keep the lights on, or you could support the show more directly over at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the notes that it is for the uh, podcast, and we'll make sure it gets directed appropriately. And uh, with your contribution, we will keep my co-host Doc Seska and Nick Garber duly caffeinated. They will drink until their liver explodes. But uh, thank you for spending some of your precious time with us. For Nick Garber and Doc Seska, I am J.R. Hanley, and this was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time where we'll indulge our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, and all things that go boom. So uh, I meant it when I said next time you have something out, we'd love to have you back. And it was, it was enjoyable chatting with you again, sir. So, so don't be a stranger. Okay. It's always fun to be here. All right. You guys have a nice one. You too.